Welcome one and all to another day, another week, another fantastic Monday here on The Damage Board with me, John Arilla, and the host of The Habituation Room, Francesca Fiorentini. How's it going? What's up? It's good. Up? Speaking of The Habituation Room, um, happy Monday, everybody. But also, I'm going to be live doing The Habituation Room in San Francisco at the end of January. So January 28th, that's a Sunday, 7 p.m. Emma Vigland, formerly of TYT, now of The Majority Report, will be there. Miles Gray of The Daily Zeitgeist, if you know that show, if you love that show. Myself and Nato Green. So come out. You guys remember how John was there last year. We sold it out. So if you missed that or if you were there, come back. It'll be so fun. Yes. Uh, so everybody... I know everybody's interested in going. I want a bunch of you to buy tickets, just not as many as when I was there. No, the room is double the full. size. The room is well, double the size because still, we sold it out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, I'm very, very excited. Obviously, I am hella jealous. I wish that I could be there. It sounds really awesome. Be fine. But um, but everyone stay tuned for more details on that. And um, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank Great you. Here. Anything about Bituation Room this week you want to say? Uh, we're going to be talking about Project 2025. That's fun. The Heritage Foundation's plan to make mm -hmm. Trump Caesar. So that's tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And NATO Green's going to join me. And uh, oh man, John, I don't know. Have you read that thousand page document? I haven't. Wait, what? <laughs> no. The Project <laughs> no, 2025. It's a thousand no, no, pages no. of like, why not just be like, dictator? I Trump know, sorry. Is dictator. I was distracted for a second because I was just thinking about a couple of specific instances from the life of Caesar. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, calm down, Congresswoman Gafford. Yeah, wow. I'm not encouraging anything. I was talking Wait, about Congresswoman. The oh, we still have to call her Congresswoman. Congresswoman. Yeah. Don't they? Do they not do that? I, I don't, don't know. know. Whatever. I don't care. But anyway, uh, everyone stay tuned for that. And we've got a lot that we're going to be talking about through the course of today's show. Probably too much, actually. Um, let's see. What will it look like day to day for Donald Trump were he to eventually go to jail? We're just going to have a little bit of fun uh, with that. Megan Kelly gets real about the state of Trump's brain. That's going to be fun. Uh, are we witnessing the rise of Nikki? Because there's this new poll. Uh oh, it's not good news for certain people. So we're gonna jump into that and a whole lot more besides. Lots of fun stuff, some stuff that's about as far from fun as could be possible. And if you are listening to the podcast, head over to the YouTube page because there's other clips that you don't see in the podcast. Never forget that, and then go rate and review us. Um, but if you're watching live, we're gonna be starting off the aftermath with uh, Elon Musk's Twitter Spaces event with just the worst people in the world. So stay tuned for that because that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, maybe as fun as our later discussion of the state of the estate tax. We'll find out together. Mm. Anyway, uh, long before that, you should hit the like button. You should share the stream. There's so many things you should do. You should send us comments, sweet super chats. We'll read them, we'll respond to them, and you might even get a $100 Blue Apron gift card. How's that sound? And uh, with all that said, Francesca, are you ready to do this thing? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Let's go. He still wants to take the stand, even though my advice is at this point, you should never take the stand with a gag order. But he is so firmly against what is happening in this court and so firmly for the old America that we know, not this America, that he will take that stand on Monday. He will open himself up to whatever they want because he's not afraid. People that are afraid cower. President Trump doesn't cower. That is Alina Haba a few days ago with a strong message about Donald Trump. And he's going to testify in that fraud trial. She doesn't even want him to. It's no. too dangerous, but he's that brave. Because you see, people who are afraid, cowards, yellow bellied cravens, cower away, but not him. He's brave. He goes right at that thing and he testifies. Except that he's not actually going to testify, he announced. No, he changed his mind. He's not going to be doing it. But wait a second. If I understand how logic works, wouldn't that mean that he's now the coward? Well, of course, they're not going to actually um, cop to that. But I think you can draw your own conclusions about what it means that Donald Trump is not going to be testifying. Um, we're going to try to learn a little bit about his decision from uh, his recent posts on Truth Social. Oh, no. Here's the first. <laughs> 
And I will say that no, I'm not. No, no. But no, can we just page one much. colon? So much. Statement of 45th President <laughs> Donald Trump. As everyone knows. <laughs> Bullet point oh. one. Roman numeral. How do you do Roman numerals? V1. Sure. Uh, like, just no, page we're not doing one. It. Dude, it's too much. Sign like, Donald Trump. Like I love how he 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 tweets the way like our parents text. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like too much. That is all <laughs> caps, and it's so many words. It's all of the words. And then if we could bring up that first one again, as bad as all of that is, how does that end? With a dot, 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 <laughs> dot. You didn't get across everything that you need to say in that thing. He said page That's one. More words than I've ever said. Anyway, I don't care. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Be successful business, blah, blah, real estate, blah, blah. Let's go to the second one because there is at least something that's legitimately hilarious in this equally long, brain burningly stupid comment. They claim that Mar-a-Lago was worth only $18 million when it is worth 50 to 100 <laughs> times that amount. A <laughs> hundred times that amount? Yes. I'm not a mathematician or anything, but that's too much money, I think. I don't, you know what? I don't like to get out over my skis on the facts, but I don't think it's worth a hundred times eighteen million dollars. That seems like too much. This broke <laughs> when you were on leave, John, and I would did I I think I did the math live on air, which is big for me. I want you to know. And it was mm-hmm. about a hundred times, and we were like, What? <laughs> what are you <laughs> are you kidding me? I think he said it was worth 1.8 billion, right? Which may if that makes sense. But like I'm like, no, there's there's no way this this piece of property, especially, I mean, I don't know, maybe when you turn it into a cemetery as he did with his ex-wife burying her there, <laughs> maybe it ups the value, not sure. Um, at yeah. least tax write-off, you know that's why he buried her there. You know that like there's special privileges when there's like an actual cadaver on, I mean, it's not the first cadaver at Mar-a-Lago, let's be real, um, but it's not uh, definitely one of, anyway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> also else? by the way, <laughs> I don't know if you are allowed to continue to add into the appraisal the value of all of the incredibly sensitive government documents now that they've been taken back from you. You have to deduct that now. It's just, it's not an asset. But anyway, it ends with, um, uh, I, I will not be testifying on Monday. MAGA. So there's, there's just a lot there. Um, look, I'm sure there are good legal reasons that he does not want to testify. I mean, after all, Alina Hubbard did say she didn't want him to testify, and she is technically a lawyer. So I don't know that it would be a good call. And by the way, remember, he has already testified uh, once. Now, he didn't answer many of the questions. He mostly used it as an opportunity to do the exact same thing that you just saw in there, which is to, you know, it's to uh, uh, attack the attorney general, attack the judge, attack the lawyers, attack the aides, attack, attack, attack. And um, occasionally say something that's incredibly damning about the effect that the oversight that you had on valuations of the Trump organization. It is believed that in this particular case, um, his own lawyers were, or his own attorneys were going to be leading the questioning. So in theory, he would have done better. But I also think that Lena Hava might have been projecting that she doesn't have confidence that he wouldn't like damn himself even in response to her own questions. So um, he seems insane here, but probably a good call legally for him for my non lawyer position. What do you think? Yeah, you can sort of hear her kind of like shudder as she says that because he's not afraid. I am. However, I'm (laughs) desperately afraid. I don't even know if I'm going to get paid for this. I mean, that's the other thing. Like if you're a lawyer for Trump at this point, you truly need him to shut the f up. Like you just need him to stop because you will not be paid the more and more he like is running his mouth and he's going to be docked, uh, docked this amount, right? Or so it's just like again, 250 million is already on the line here. Um, mm-hmm. He can only make it worse. Um, she probably wants to help him make it better. And yeah, she. It's good that he's not testifying. I can't believe. Out of all these criminal lawsuits hanging over him, I mean, this is not one of them, but that he's still allowed to run his mouth the way he is. She sort of alluded to the fact that it would be bad for him to testify, even as she said it would be brave, because she said there's a gag order 
on him, yeah. right? So well, and Chris Kai said he 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 referenced that too. The unconstitutional gag order. Why is it, why is it unconstitutional? Get he's not the first gag order that has ever existed, and I don't know if anyone has ever done more to justify it. Not just prior to the gag order, but since the gag order. He constantly is attacking the very specific people that he is not supposed to attack. He was supposed to take down his comments about one of these attorneys, and it's still they're still up there. Yeah. I don't even know legally how that how that works. I mean, I, I get that he's effectively playing chicken with the judge and with the judicial system, but he seems to be winning because they don't seem to want to go any further than this. And I, it doesn't I, bode well either, John. Yeah, and and I mean to say nothing of what he said about Letitia James, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who again, the the trial is you know now not in her hands anymore. But it you know again, you you just think like the fact that they've been soft pedaling on this gag order on the things that he said during this trial makes you realize that yeah, push comes to shove, whether it's this case or other charges, if he is convicted of them. How much soft peddling is going to happen when it comes to holding him accountable? You know, he's never going to see the inside of a prison cell. Of course not. He definitely, he might not even be held on house arrest. You know, and like, like this is the kind of thing where it's like, no matter what, there's a two tier justice system. Trump proves that every single day that he is allowed to continue to run his mouth, incite violence against the very people that if this were any other defendant, are you kidding me? They would yeah. be held. They would be ta detained right now, um, but I, not him. So, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because th this is like there is so much about our reality that does not make any sense. That in fact makes the exact opposite of of uh, sense. Like so, for instance, everything that Elon Musk says that proves that he is an idiot, an incurious moron, to millions of Americans proves that he is a genius. In this particular case, all of the things that Donald Trump says prove that everything is aligned against him. The judicial system is set up specifically to target him and only him. All of it proves how he is singularly protected from the consequences <laughs> that would be levied against any other person in America. Um, but millions of Americans don't see that. In fact, they just see what he says, even though the evidence in front of their eyes is that everyone else would be locked up and he is not. So it's frustrating. But what they don't understand is that I am willing to go to jail if that's what it takes for our country to win and become a democracy again. I don't know what that has to do with it, but he doesn't mind sacrificing himself to go to jail is a massive lie. But what if it turned out to be the case? It doesn't look super likely at this point. Donald Trump has been able to make it this far in his life without suffering any of the consequences for the actions he has taken. But were he to, what would jail be like for Donald Trump? Well, a number of experts spoke to Newsweek about what that situation could look like. And as unlikely as it might be, <laughs> it could get rough for him. So one of the things that they predicted was that he would be at an elevated level of risk compared to others in prison. Not specifically because people in there would hate him necessarily, but that it provides an opportunity, his presence. Were you to do something to him, then you're in the history books for the rest of time. Were you able to get to him and harm him, what they're speculating, and that would be horrendous, would be that they might make a name for themselves by attacking him. Now. Others are saying that he would most likely be placed in the most minimum of security prison ever. And I get it, you don't need tall walls for a guy who's not gonna be able to hop over a turnstile. Um, but that might mean that he would be open to less risk. But a former prosecutor said, in Trump's case, there's a unique risk to his safety because he's a former president. So the BOP would have to make sure he's at a minimum security threat. Our facility with no threat of violent inmates isolated from the general population, which he's willingly done his entire life. <laughs> um, in Georgia, the Department of Corrections would have to make a similar determination. Their options include state prison, private prisons, or detention center. The reference there at the end is that, look, we have to consider multiple different possibilities because some of these are federal crimes, some of them are state level crimes, and the situations in those uh, facilities are different, obviously. We have more details, but Francesca, what do you think? I mean, it makes me smile to imagine him in prison. I again, don't think it's going to happen. Again, if anything, it would be 
uh, house arrest and community service, and he'll just complain about how he'd had to wear a hairnet uh, while yeah. you know working at a soup kitchen for the rest of his life. Um, no, uh, but yeah, we saw what happened to Derek Chauvin recently, right? He was you know beaten in jail, um, and look, if you are again another inmate or someone who's there and prison is a rough place, yeah. Going after a high level target like that or someone, a high level criminal, a famous criminal, that could get you some respect in jail. However, I foresee Trump, if he ever were to serve, John, don't you think he'll just be like playing cards with the prison guards and telling them how he's gonna like make prison great again? And he's, <laughs> you know, and like, or I mean, and this is what we've always been dreaming of. Like, like you know how all after January 6th, all these right wingers are starting to realize, hey, prison's bad. Yeah, the food sucks. Your treatment's terrible. It's cold. You, it's not like you have your human rights anymore. Um, yeah. It could probably be better. Like if only he would actually do prison reform. That might be, if we can reverse engineer real prison reform by putting Trump there, I'm for it. I don't think that's yeah. gonna happen. I think he would flourish is as the king of like a prison gang. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, based purely off of like the TV shows that I've watched, Oz sure. and stuff like that. I understand that there are certain sort of, let's say, groups in prison. Mm, yeah, what kind? You no, know, they like certain <laughs> types of tattoos. I'm just saying, yeah. those people would. There might be some ideological overlap there. He sure. might be get some protection from these people. That's yeah, all I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and I felt the same way as you about the reform. With uh, remember when Marjorie Green was going around saying like they're keeping the January six people in solitary confinement. It is horrible that they specifically are being kept there. I'm not going to yes. do anything about it more. Broadly. They're white. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, white right. conservatives. Are <laughs> and look, let me say, I, I, if Donald Trump does go to prison, I, I don't want anything to happen to him. I, it's like I think it's horrendous that we. A rich, powerful, relatively civilized country cannot maintain the security and safety of people who are being locked up. The fact yeah. that it is still conceivable, the, the amount of corruption that goes on there that he would definitely exploit the, 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 the both physical and sexual like threats to your well being, it is, it should be a national tragedy that that is still a thing. Um, and bear in mind that a lot of conservatives, Republican politicians don't give a damn about that because it's happening to people who don't count for anything. Mm -hmm. But were Trump to go in, they would want him to be protected, but they would not extend the sphere of that concern any farther than his body, unfortunately. What if he becomes um, radicalized? He becomes, he joins like the Nation of Islam, he gets woke. That'd be tight. What if that's the journey? <laughs> what if he gets? You know what jacked? they have in prison is they have books. You know what I'm saying? And he could open mm -hmm. one in his life. He might learn. He might. He might. Um, by the way, they they talk about you know one of the options for protecting him is putting him in solitary confinement. But obviously, as we have talked about before, and we care about, but the right doesn't. That's long term horrendous for you. But then I thought like, it's not just solitary confinement that's going to be hard for him. Just any confinement that means that he can't do rallies, can't tweet. Yeah. I don't think he has any capability to deal with that. <laughs> no. It no. is going to be a rough time for him, even if, and I hope he is physically and sexually protected from anything else that's allowed uh, to go on. <laughs> I really just don't say sexually protected. No. Yeah. It's. No yeah. one's coming near him. No one's coming near I that. You no, Come on not. now. And a general who's a fantastic general actually said to me, sir, I've been on the battlefield, men have gone down on my left and on my right. I stood on hills where soldiers were killed. But I believe the bravest thing I've ever seen was the night you went onto that stage with Hillary Clinton after what happened. And then that woman asked you the first question about it. And I said, locker room talk. It's locker room talk. What the hell? What are you talking about? <laughs> oh my God. He is talking about the Access Hollywood grab them by the P word tape. And he is saying that, sir, sir, it was so brave, sir, that a general told him that that was the, the bravest thing he's ever seen. Yep. Is when Trump, after having been exposed for being a you know, serial assaulter, 
didn't run away from a debate that he'd already agreed to do and was asked a question about it by that woman wasn't a woman. It was Anderson Cooper who asked him the question. Just in his mind, it has to be a woman who was mean to him because that's what he thinks about hey, women. It makes the story scarier, John. And he it said, makes surviving it. Yeah. yeah, you were you were so a, a woman asked you a question, and you're still alive. Yeah. <gasps> that's and assault. That, like that was that was to the New York Young Republican Club. I am going to guess that virtually every one of those young Republicans goes out and pretends, maybe some do, have a ton of respect for those who serve in the armed forces. And he just made up a general to say, I've seen soldiers get blown away. That's nothing. You answered a question about you sexually assaulting people and made light of it. That was your response. It wasn't a brave response where you took stock of the monster that you are and pledged to do better. You just apologized for your own horrendously misogynistic, violent remarks. How yeah. is the, how is every Republican who pretends to care about the armed forces not attacking him for that? Also, we know what he said from his own cabinet, what he has said about veterans. Yeah, Doesn't understand true. what they died for. They were losers if they died, that their wars were not justified or you know not good causes, even World War II. He he didn't care. He absolutely didn't care. Didn't want to get out of the limo, right? To like get his shoes yeah. wet to go kneel uh, at a soldier's grave. Like there's so many stories about he how he disrespects veterans. To say nothing of what he tried to do to the VA during his time in office. Um, but John, you know, thinking about the grab them by the p word tape, like that for me. In addition to the good people on both sides. In addition to him meeting with Putin and going. Stop tapping us. Stop stop mm -hmm. infiltrating our election. Do do do. Those three moments are standout of like that should have been career ending. That should have been career ending. That should have been career ending. But they weren't. If it were anyone else, that would have been over. Curtains. And the fact that he's bringing it up means he relishes in his impunity. And especially mm -hmm. around something like that that again would have ended any other politician, I don't care Republican or Democrat, saying that yeah, I said that it's locker room talk. I, I basically admitted that I sexually assault women, locker room talk. I mean, it's yeah. wild what this man represents. And yeah, you're right. All those little like young Republicans, they're not like, oh, I want to serve war. They're like, oh, I want to be big and strong and grab women by the P word do. Like, that's what that uh, is. Yeah, I, uh, God, the whole thing is so frustrating. By the way, I, I want to reference. So, someone in the YouTube chat said, but did he apologize for it? And yes. Technically, back in 2016, he did apologize. And if you just read the sentence of his apology, it's not a hor horrendous apology mm. when he said it doesn't represent who I am. I mean, that's ridiculous. It 100% represents who he is, but whatever. <laughs> that, that's his apology. He apologized. And so, I, look, I don't know the politics of the person who asked that, but if that's supposed to be a, well, so then why are you mad at what he just said? Because here's the thing what he just said wasn't calling back. To his apology, he called back to, come on, locker room talk, it's locker room talk. There's two pasts that he could hold up as a fake made up instance of his bravery. Because again, remember, the general doesn't exist, all this is made up. It could be the apology or it could be him joking about it on the debate stage and he chose to focus on the joking. So seven years after the apology, which do you think is a more accurate reflection of who he is? The one that he appears to have completely forgotten about or the one that he's still referencing to this day. Do you think that Donald Trump has faded from where he was in 2020? There's no question Trump has lost a step or multiple steps. He is confusing Joe Biden for Obama. I know he's now saying he intentionally did that. Go back and look at the clips. It wasn't intentional. It was very, it, look, any of us could have a slip of, of the tongue, but it's happening to him repeatedly. The reference about how somebody's going to get us into World War II, um, confusing countries, confusing cities where he is. And it's happening more and more. But are we really going to pretend that Donald Trump is just as vibrant and mentally sharp as he was in 16? Uh, okay. 
And I think some right wingers will if they believe that it's in their political or you know monetary advantage, unfortunately. But that is Megyn Kelly talking with Glenn Beck. And I have never agreed with her more or at all. That's the first time I've ever mm -hmm. agreed with her, and it's the most that I've ever agreed with her. But you know, Trump does say that the better explanation is sarcasm, that he is he's making a point with all of these slip ups. Um, and I want to demonstrate that. We actually have a recent example. Let's go to that. She sued ExxonMobil in 2019. Letitia James, in a much watched legal battle, the end result was that Exxon moved out of New York. How do you think that's a good idea? ExxonMobil, one of the biggest companies in the world, left New York and they went to Dallas. Great job, Letitia. And that's what's happening right now. Businesses are fleeing our country and they're going to other places, but they're fleeing New York State and no businesses are coming back. Nobody wants to come back into New York State, but they're actually fleeing to other countries. Yeah, so we looked it up. I'm not a geographer, but we looked it up. And Dallas, as of right now at least, still in the United States. Here's a map to prove it. Uh, so look, I get that he's just bopping back and forth between the different points that he wants to make. So. He wants to say blue state bad, red state good. You leave blue state, go red state. But also they leave our country and it just gets all jumbled up. Like his brain is on a spin cycle or something. But when you mix them up like that, it doesn't make any sense the point that you're making. And wouldn't you be making the point that it's better, that they should be going to Texas, that Texas is low taxes or whatever. It just he doesn't know how to express the thoughts that he has anymore. But he has he ever? Does I he ever? I, I mean, he's never really been coherent. More common now, for sure. But it's like it'll do. You know what I mean? Like that's <laughs> that that's good enough, right? For his base, his base is not fact checking him. His base doesn't care that he's saying something. You know. Whatever, like that doesn't make sense, that's incoherent, that isn't logical. No one is following him to a logical conclusion. It's pure emotion of corporations and businesses are leaving the United States um, and, and or blue states and or it doesn't matter. I think he still got it and you don't have, it is just, again, strongman neo-fascism that is nonsensical and and he's got a vision. I mean, I think that it's really important to still understand the threat that he's posing, even as incoherent as he is. I want to ask you a question. Um, no. So, like, I, yeah, no, I'm going to do my show. Uh, you're gonna have to log off to stop me. Um, so, why we, we've had all of these Republicans who try to do a version of Trump? Why hasn't any of them been able to do it better than him? Like be, the, be. the formula seems <laughs> well. Hold up, the, the formula yeah, seems pretty easy. Yeah, and he has the he has like moldy tapioca for brains. So why has none of them been able to do a better version than Donald Trump of being this proto-fascist wannabe dictator? Well, first of all, you know, the, you know, it's knockoff versus the real thing, even if the real thing is like on its last leg. But also, they don't believe themselves. Trump. Absolutely, he is a sociopathic narcissist. He believes everything that comes out of his mouth. You think DeSantis believes anything he says? Hell no. You think Ted Cruz? You think you know any of these people? Mike Johnson, Marjorie Green, even you know Marjorie Green is basically a socialist. She's just parroting. She watches this show. Come on now, like nobody believes Hello, what they're Congress. saying. Hi, yeah. girl. What's up? Um, join the revolution. Uh, like she does not. Nobody believes what they're saying. They're all angling. They're all doing this. They're, it's all a calculation. He just is. He just says it, right? And that authenticity is very real. I mean, it's what people said they saw in Bernie Sanders as well. Bernie Sanders obviously didn't give uh, you know what. He's never. He's just like, I'm running for president because uh, the rich have way too much. And everyone's like, yes. Mm -hmm. So again, the outsider status. And I think we've yet, we have yet to see an outsider in the same way. I mean, maybe it's Marjorie yeah. Green, but again, like I don't know. That's that's my opinion. I there's so many grifters on the right, and they all like claim this brand, this ideology, and they're all fr from an outsider's point of view, such bad examples of it. And it still sells. I guess the standards don't exist, but I just don't understand why, like, there's not one actual relatively intelligent, maybe in the 
like okay physical shape wannabe fascists to do the <laughs> alpha thing that they all say they worship, but none of them can remotely live up to. It's weird to me. I'm not. I'm not a candidate. You want me to work that for you? <laughs> This is my kids would say, that's my jam. There is precious little time left for those trying to beat Donald Trump in this Republican primary and few opportunities to really break through. Now, many of them were hoping that that last debate last week would be their their chance to really like draw some attention. And they have succeeded, but not necessarily the attention they want. Uh, despite the fact that he wasn't there, Donald Trump apparently was tuning in because he had this to say about the contenders. So many people are asking what I thought of history's lowest rated presidential debate and how I would rate the players. It's so easy to be a critic, apparently easier than to be a debater. But on who on this subject would be better than me? To begin with, I thought Ron was terrible with his bobblehead facial movements and his walking on eggs. But that's not because Christie was worse. Stupid. He's not fit mentally or physically to be president. Plus, he suffers from TDS and levels not seen before. In other words, he is a sick puppy. On top of it all, his poll numbers are just 1%. In a class with Ida Hutchinson, in quotation marks, nobody understands what that is a reference to, what? including what? Donald Trump, who could not remember why he came up with that in an interview. Anyway, <laughs> he's dead, but so is Ron, whose weird bobbing head and fresh mouth make his high heels look he's good. super fresh mouth and his he's high heels. He's walking on eggs. He's got that fresh, fresh, sweet, fresh mouth and, the, oh. and his high heels. No. So fresh with his head. He's on walking his on eggs. eggs. You already did the eggs. You just did the eggs before. Yeah, and, and you did it wrong. You did the egg shells the and you shells, had another chance it's and it's eggs. Okay. <laughs> if you could actually walk on eggs, you would be walking delicately. You'd be legolas basically. Anyway, bird brain looked different and lost, but I give her second place, Nikki Haley. Vivek wins. Because he thinks I'm great. The biggest loser is Megan Kelly. What the hell happened to her? She has lost whatever she once had, which wasn't very much. Some things never change. And um, I believe that is a direct response to the video of Megan Kelly that we played for you earlier on the show. It's uh, just projection. He's sure something is said to him, he has to say it right back to them. But anyway, um, so there's a lot of negative stuff that he has to say, but he was like maybe arguably most dismissive of Nikki Haley. Just call your bird brain saying that she lost. Well, I don't know. She's making waves for herself and she might have lost the poll, but she's beating Donald Trump in um, a certain area. That's uh, general election polling against Joe Biden. Haley, in this new poll from the Wall Street Journal, has a 17 point lead over Joe Biden in a one on one contest. 17 points. Now, in that same poll, Trump is up four points over Biden, but that's nothing compared to Nikki Haley. Uh, by the way, it turns out that if Trump were convicted of a felony, he would only trail Biden by a single point. He would lose five points. That is what being convicted of a felony is worth in this country. But anyway, Nikki Haley is beating Trump over Biden by like double, literally double digits. Now, that doesn't mean that she's going to make it to the general election, Francesca. But what do you think of this poll? I mean, honestly, it's it's not surprising. Um, I don't think she's going to be the party's nominee. Um, but it isn't surprising that someone who is at least 10 years younger, right, can string together sentences. It seems like a sort of sensible conservative centrist and has a bunch of backing and continues to have money in terms of her campaign. Um, I mean, who doesn't love Dick Cheney and high heels except for anyone with, you know, two cents and just the mm -hmm. thought of that image. Um, but no, I think it makes sense. I think it absolutely makes sense with conservatives looking for, I think that's why, you know, Joe Biden made sense to folks who were like, hey, I like Trump, but I don't want to die. And there's mm -hmm. a pandemic and it's coming for old folks like me. A lot of folks switched over. Now there seems to be a sensible conservative in the race. And again, I don't think she's going to get the nomination, but I think it's massive that she's polling better than Biden and Donald Trump. Um, it shows that I think she has some kind of wherewithal that let's be real, neither of these candidates have at this point. Yeah. 
I, I just imagine there's probably a lot of Republicans who have to like support Trump, but all all they want is business deregulation and low taxes. That's all they actually exactly. care about. They don't care if the rest of the world burns. Looking at that poll and be like, can we just get Nikki Haley? Because that yes. would be a bloodbath. And as Nikki Haley points out in response to the poll, it isn't just that she would, as of right now, allegedly destroy Biden, but that that would be a wave that could bring in new governors, bigger majorities in the Senate and the House, and God knows what else, but instead Trump. Um, by the way, uh, Ken Langone, co-founder of Home Depot, billionaire right-wing donor, uh, has endorsed Nikki Haley just a few days ago. You'd already had the Koch brothers. So now the big money on the right is lining up behind her. She is still, unfortunately, at least in Iowa, so that which will be coming up in just less than a month or about a month, a oh my month God. and a few days. Oh my um, God. If we bring up this poll, she is not, she's kind of like stagnant. Since October, she hasn't gained anything. And uh, Donald Trump is now at 51% um, for first choice in that caucus. And so, you know, it's looking better for Trump somehow. Even though all of this stuff seems to be lining up behind Nikki Haley. And um, I don't know. She, I just, by the way, can we really fast? I want your response. Bird brain looked different and lost, but I give her second place. What does that mean? That means running mate. That's like running mate vibes right there, right? Yeah. Bird brain. Different? Bird brain different. Bird brain maybe AI. Bird brain deep fake. But uh, you know, second mm. place. Not bad. Vivek is great because he loves me. Um, yeah. I think it's really, John, we're almost at the end of the year. Do we realize how insane 2024 is going to be? I know. It's going to be wild. Be. Wild. Because I do think there is a world that neither Trump nor Biden end up being the nominee. I know that's wild to say. Mm -hmm. But I feel like some some stuff's going to go down that none of us are going to be yeah. able to predict. And you know how good I am at predicting stuff. Well, actually, you know, you just reminded me. So every year we do our top 10 predictions for our members on YouTube. And uh, you uh, famously predicted the invasion of Ukraine. That's right. So uh, maybe next week we're going to go back and look at our predictions for this year and see how accurate it was. But coming up in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing our predictions for 2024. and. She is basically Nostradamus, That's so right. everyone is going to want to become a member so that you can watch <laughs> that. Anyway, um, okay. So, uh, by the way, how happy is Vivek Ramaswamy? So all, uh -huh. all he, he all he's doing this for is so that Trump will say something nice about him. That's the whole point that he's running against Trump for is so that Trump loves him. The people of Gaza only decided to break the siege. The walls of the concentration camp on October 7th. And yes, I was happy to see people breaking the siege and throwing down the shackles of their own land and walk free into their lands that they were not allowed to walk in. And yes, the people of Gaza have the right to self-defense. So that right there is video from a few weeks ago of Nahad Awad, National Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations that is being spread now thanks to the Middle East Media Research Institute, which is a Washington based group that collects video and spreads it that was founded by a veteran Israeli intelligence officer. The Biden administration is distancing themselves now from Awad. They had the right is trying to draw a link between the Biden administration and CARE because back in May, there was a listening session on Islamophobia that one member of the organization was involved with, uh, I believe it was uh, Harris. Um, but anyway, um, Awad is saying that that video has been selectively edited to remove the context. And we are going to read to you his remarks in relation to that. I will say um, that he has been very clear for a number of years about what he thinks about anti Semitism and how civilians should be targeted and all of that. That said, the comments that were, even if they're clipped out, they did not seem to be well received even by the people in the room. There was very tepid, a little bit of applause. So saying that you celebrated it when people broke through, when the consequences of the breaking through was well over a thousand people being murdered, you can understand why people are not responding well to those comments. That said, we're gonna get to 
his updated commentary in a second, but Francesco wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. I mean, I understand how it can be perceived as crass. He did not say, however, that he celebrated anyone killing anybody, right? He's talking about breaking the siege. Again, a 17 year siege of Gaza that is prevented before 18,000 people have been killed in this war by Israel. Before that, the 17 year siege, which prevented basic things like medicine, food aid, right? Like 80 to 90% of Gazans were already dependent on food aid to say nothing of what's happening now. This is a massive distraction. I understand, and we'll talk about his full comments. I understand that it might come across as crass, but it is true that the refugees who live in Gaza, they used to live just right over there in a city that is now named something completely different. They have the keys to the homes that they used to live into, but were pushed into Gaza in 1948 by, by a Zionist project, right? So like, yeah, have a little bit of context and empathy, yes, empathy for the people of Gaza, not Hamas, right? Not the murder of civilians. So again, I really think this is a massive distraction at a time that this war is showing no sl- signs of slowing down. Yeah, look, if, if you're saying that it's a distraction, that's fine. And we're gonna get to general updates about what's going on in Gaza in just a moment. I, I would say everything that you said is accurate, Except that those people who you're showing empathy to are not, they didn't do the breaking through. So this is a bad opportunity, I think, to make that point. It's not like, and I was saying this in our production meeting, there was a generalized uprising and breakthrough. And then radical Hamas fighters took advantage of that and murdered over a thousand people. That's what this was. It, the breakthrough was only for that to happen. It wasn't a. It wasn't an unfortunate side effect. That's what the event was. And wanting there to be more justice, I think I understand that, and I understand everything that you're saying about people being you know, driven from their land and being utterly subjugated and everything. But this particular incident was not that. It was just breaking through to murder and kidnap civilians largely. You know so, what, but there were there were a lot of civilians who protested uh, around this day in Gaza and before. Did we talk about that? No, we never talk about that. Why? Because it was nonviolent, oh, whatever. So it's like now suddenly yeah, we're talking true. about it. I mean, it's just why, again, the grand flattening, the grand moral flattening between mm-hmm. one of the most advanced militaries in, in the world that is systematically targeting civilians using AI, that is killing people based on the things that they tweet. And the people of Gaza, who yes, have a militant wing among them that yes, targeted civilians. And yes, a lot of Israeli military officials as well. It's just like, I don't even, it's like, Mm -hmm. it is apples to oranges, John. I understand what you're saying. I am not celebrating. I just think that these comments are like, yeah, okay, okay. And, and babies were left without incubators, dying, decomposing. In on beds in hospitals, like yeah. what are we talking I, about I, here? I, yeah, you're 100. I'm not interested in that moral flattening either. And you are 100 right. And I think that we've been very clear in our commentary that we oppose the near industrialized mass murder machine that is being run in no small part thanks to the assistance and technology of the United States that's being aided by AI. That even Elon Musk was talking about AI with the, the Israeli military. I guess that's how he's going to deal with. You know, the anti Semitic brouhaha that he raised was, I guess, helping more civilians to be murdered. But, John, this Um, is the point. I mean, we can talk about his comments, but this is the point. The point is for us to get distracted by this one man's comments with Council on uh, on American Islamic Relations is an incredible organization who have faced Mm -hmm. down death threats for years and years and years. Some incredible people, they document the hate crimes against uh, Muslim people in this country. They have done it for years since 9-11. They are an admirable group. And so sorry one guy said a bad thing in a way that was taken out of context, again, this is the yeah. point of distracting us and you and substituting and putting on equal footing words with actions and they yeah. are not on equal footing but let's continue I, yes. we can- as a general point I, I do agree with you uh, and I have no doubt that, that that's why the, the video is being spread is to attempt to distract I would say I host a daily 90 minute show I can do both 
So yeah. I don't consider myself to be distracted. Um, but I just want to very fast give him an opportunity to say what he believes. He's, he says that that's um, uh, taken out of context. And by the way, these are his new comments. They're largely reflective of what he has said for literally years about civilians not being targeted and all that. But he said, um, as I said, the hatred, the prejudice, the violence, the discrimination against Jews because of their faith or their life or their religious practices is a hateful mindset, behavior and action. We as human beings, as Muslims, as Palestinians see it as evil the way it is. And it should be condemned because anti-Semitism is a real phenomenon, a real evil, and it has to be rejected and combated by all people, regardless of their faith, tradition, ideology, or those people who have no ideology. It is an attack on humanity and should be clearly condemned by all people. The average Palestinians who briefly walked out of Gaza and set foot on their ethnically cleansed land in a symbolic act of defiance against the blockade and stopped there without engaging in violence were within their rights under international law. <clears throat> The extremists who went on to attack civilians in southern Israel were not. Targeting civilians is unacceptable, no matter whether they are Israeli or Palestinian or any other nationality, which I agree with. And, and there we go. He's previously said, yes. Yes, I would just say, that, that, work that into the original comment. I'm just saying, and again, that's why I pointed out the response from the crowd. They didn't seem to think that he had worded his thoughts well. Right, they were like, I hope we're saying something else. But again, it is true that there were people who were not engaged in some of that violence who did briefly break through and that was symbolic and is incredibly important. Um, and and again, like we talked about prison gangs and Trump being the head of the prison gang. Gaza's a prison. Do y'all <laughs> think that the head of the prison, what prison gang do you know is like, cool on human rights is like a dope prison. No, when you lock people in a place, guess what happens? The people who rise to the top of that prison, not good people. Does that mean mm -hmm. all the prisoners should be mass murdered? No, and we'll get into the Hamas stuff. I mean, it's yes. an important question. I mean, I think this is a great conversation, John. That's why I like, how, I'm glad you're doing this story and I'm glad we're talking about it. And I know it's not an easy um, story to do. Yeah, well, and by the way, I think the analogy that you just made, we'll wait until we get to this uh, New York Times thing. I just want to briefly mention that a couple of days ago, the US uh, vetoed the UN resolution calling for a Gaza ceasefire. It's expected that there's going to be another effort this week. But just when I say, you know, that this industrial mass murder machine is being aided by the United States, here's a great way that we do that. We tweet about wanting a pause and everything, and oh, behind the scenes, we're saying all the right thing, but we literally stop the resolution. So anyway, uh, the UK, by the way, abstained. Oh. Um, but I did want to just reference, and everyone should check this out in the New York Times. Uh, there's this article, Buying Quiet Inside the Israeli Plan that Propped Up uh, Hamas. And it talks about, and I'd previously said that I think John Oliver did a great uh, bit of coverage on this like a month ago, that there was this strategy that contemporaneous journalists were revealing uh, by the Israeli government, including Netanyahu specifically, to keep Hamas strong. Mm -hmm. Not so strong that they could do October 7th, although that is what ended up happening, but they didn't think that's what was gonna happen. But strong enough that it would stop some alternative, less radical power from rising up to govern and represent the Palestinian people. Yeah. It was effectively he an idea that we can create a villain that we can demonize and they'll control everything, but surely it won't blow up in our face. And that looks really, really bad now in light of what's happened. Absolutely, and the last thing I'll say is that um, they did know that October seventh was happening. In fact, for a year, uh, there were there was uh, intelligence reports from the Israeli military that this plan was going to happen. The New York Times about a week ago mm -hmm. uh, detailed how specific Hamas was in terms of carrying out that plan. Um, to that reflected the intelligence that Israel had gotten, and somehow and for some reason. They didn't take it seriously and now people are dead and now 18,000 more in Gaza have been murdered. Exactly, yeah, the Operation Jericho, which if you people wanna search, we have a video about that on our channel. Um, yeah, and so uh, to continue your analogy, uh, that's basically saying um, we're gonna create one dominant gang and then they'll keep all the other gangs and no one, you know, no one will be able to like rise up and challenge them. That'll be fine, it won't cause any problems or whatever. And it's caused a lot of problems. And yeah, the total death toll for the, the conflict is now over 20,000. And obviously it is as disproportionately weighted towards Palestinian civilian deaths as every one of these conflicts has been going back decades and decades. And um, while we're gonna talk about a lot of different stories in this, as Francesca said, don't allow like the talk about rhetoric and argument and all that 
to override the fact that thousands of lives are gone. They cannot be brought back. Many thousands, tens of thousands will be lost in the coming months, both from the immediate attacks as well as the collapse of the infrastructure of Gaza. That is all true. Those are the actual stakes in this. And those Final lives comment. can be saved and, and, and that it's not a done deal. Be. And future yes. lives can be saved and people do not have to die and the cycle of violence can end. I agree. That is all the time we have for the first hour, everyone. More to come in the aftermath, though, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.